Hey guys, Dusty Smith here, and today I thought I'd tell you guys about the most traumatic and crazy shit that's ever happened to me. I'm actually kind of surprised that nobody ever made one of those true crime documentary episodes about this, because it's really a crazy ass story. And this is kind of my origin story if you think about it, because this directly led to me being on YouTube today. So I thought I'd share it with you guys. Um, as most of you know, I grew up really fucking poor. I grew up in the poorest state and in the poorest part of that state. And growing up, my dad wasn't around very much, so I didn't have very many male role models in my life. But one of the male role models I did have in my life was my Uncle Kenny. And my Uncle Kenny was a Vietnam vet. He did two tours in Vietnam as a radio operator. And he came back kind of fucked up, I guess. But I liked him. I thought he was a cool guy. I actually thought he was a brilliant guy. This guy would go to the library every single week and check out the maximum amount of books that would let him check out. And he would read every single one of them. He read at least one book every day or two. And he was the kind of guy that would watch Jeopardy, and he would get every fucking question. I had never seen anything like it. So I actually thought he was really smart. And he's the one that got me into computers to begin with. Like I said, I was really poor, around a bunch of other poor people, and nobody had computers back then. But my Uncle Kenny did, and he's the one that got me interested in computers. While other 12-year-olds in Mississippi were out playing in a ditch, I was in my room programming my own choose-your-own-adventure games in BASIC. And because of this, I guess I was a little bit more advanced than other kids my age. So I moved out of my house when I was 16 years old. I moved from Carrollton, Mississippi to Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, Mississippi is the biggest city in Mississippi. It's the capital. And I moved out there when I was 16. I got my own apartment when I was 16. I worked at a dry cleaners at night and I went to high school in the daytime. Well, while I was in Jackson, I met this guy through my cousins named Vinay Baggett. He was this rich Indian kid. And he was a really cool guy. Me and him started hanging out. We became pretty close friends. I would go over his house every single day. It was the cool place to hang out because they always had giant TVs and the latest gaming systems from all over the world. And Vinay had this little sister named Melanie. And I guess I thought she was cute and kind of got a little crush on her. And I guess she had kind of a little crush on me too. Because uh, eventually we started dating or going out or being boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever little pilly shit you want to call it. She's actually one of the first girls I learned to kiss with. And I felt really sorry for her because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I would literally just jam my tongue down her throat uh, and move it around. Like, that's the only kind of kissing I did. I thought that's how you were supposed to fucking kiss. And I guess she didn't fucking know because she just went along with it. Poor girl. But anyway, Melanie and Vinay had this dad named Jay Baggett. And Jay Baggett was an incredibly good dude. He was so fucking cool. And he treated me like part of the family. Of all the fathers I've ever met in my life, I would have to say he's probably the best father I ever met. He was the pinnacle that I wish my father had been. And Jay was a really brilliant dude. He was the vice president of this company called Intel, which was the first pager company. I think he designed some of the satellites for them or something. And uh, his technology directly led to modern day texting. So all you kids out there mashing buttons and texting away can thank him for helping pave the way for this. And like I said, they treated me like I was part of the family. They used to let me drive around town in their $70,000 Mercedes Benz. And I remember one time he took me to a New Orleans Saints game. His company, Intel, had executive box seats on the 49 yard line. And he took me to a game one time and I actually got to sit right next to the owner of the Saints. When the Saints would score, the owner would get up and dance around and the camera would film him and I was sitting right next to him. And they had this big VIP box with giant TVs and free food and free drinks and people that would come out and fucking serve you and all. And it's without a doubt one of my happiest memories. You know, I was a poor kid. I had never seen anything like that. Never done anything like that in my life. So to me, it was fucking awesome. Well, anyway, I was friends with Vinay for about a year, dated his sister for about six months. And one day, I can't remember what it was about, but me and Vinay got in a stupid fight over something. And he told me to leave his house and never come back. So basically that broke me and his sister up. I left this house and never went back and I actually got thrown out of school not long after that. So I never saw Vinay or Melanie again. So skip forward a few months. I'm 17 at this time and I'm working full time at a hardware store. And one day I took a trip back to Carrollton, Mississippi where I lived. And my Uncle Kenny was living in Carrollton. He was staying with my grandma. I guess like I said, he was kind of fucked up in the head from Vietnam and he didn't want to get a job. He never really worked. I think he was afraid to be around other people, um, partially because I think he was afraid somebody would insult him or disrespect him and he would hurt them or do something really bad or fly off the handle. And so he didn't want to be around anybody else. So he mainly just stayed with my grandma and kind of leached off her and he borrowed a lot of money from other members of the family. Apparently he had made some kind of land deal in California years earlier 
and he had been waiting and waiting and waiting for the land deal to go through. And he was promising everybody that he borrowed money from that when the land deal came through, he would buy everybody cars and computers and everybody would be living large. So one day I'm down there visiting him and I start bragging like a motherfucker about how awesome it was to stay with Vinay and how rich they were and how they took me to the Saints game and we sat on the 49 yard line and I was talking about their fancy cars and their big house. And thinking back, I can even remember Michael Kenny asking me, are you sure they have all that money? How much money do you think they have? So of course, I'm a dumb kid and I don't think anything about it. I'm just like, yeah, man, that dude's loaded. He has millions of dollars. And Kenny was like, are you sure he has millions of dollars? And I was like, yeah, man, they're rich as fuck. Obviously, I had no idea what the fuck was going to happen or I would have kept my goddamn mouth shut. So anyway, skip forward about a month or two and I'm sitting in my apartment in Jackson, Mississippi and I get a phone call from Uncle Kenny and he says, can you come down to Carrollton, which like I said was about two hours away and he wanted me to pick him up and bring him to Jackson because he told me that he was going to take a bus to California and finally get his money. And I was fucking happy for him because I knew how long he had been waiting for this money to come in. So I was like, yeah, dude, I'm off tomorrow. I'll come down there, pick you up, bring you up here. So the next day I drive all the way to Carrollton, Mississippi. I get my Uncle Kenny. I bring him all the way back to my house. And he's acting kind of strange the whole time, but I didn't really press him on it. I just thought he was kind of nervous going back to California for some reason. So he comes back to my apartment and he spends the night and the next day I have to go to work. So I said goodbye to him and I told him I'd see him soon. And he was kind of sad, but he told me he would see me later. And I left, and I guess later that day, he called over to my Aunt Susie's house, who also lived in Jackson. Aunt Susie, as you might remember, is the lady from the video I made called My Favorite Aunt Sent Me a Nasty Email. We were actually pretty close back then. This was before I became an atheist and started my atheist channel, and she stopped liking me. So he calls over there, and he asks my cousin Shanna to come pick him up and take him to the bus station. So she comes over to my apartment, picks him up, and takes him to the bus station. They say goodbye. Everything's normal and everything. So the next day, I'm off work. And it's about probably eight o'clock at night. And I'm sitting on the phone talking to another girlfriend I had, my hairy armed Indian girlfriend, who you might remember from my other video about it. I guess I had a tight back then because I dated two different Indian girls in a row. So I'm talking to her on the phone and there's a knock on the door. So I'm like, I'll be right back. And I put the phone down and I go open the door and there's four big burly dudes standing there looking at me mean. And they're like, are you Dusty Smith? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And they're like, we're with the FBI. Can we come in and talk to you for a second? And of course, I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck? But of course, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So my first thought was that something had happened at the hardware store I was working. Maybe the people I was working for were into some shit they weren't supposed to be into and they were going to question me about it. You know, I didn't know. So I was like, yeah, sure, come on in. So they came on in and they were like, did you go to work today? Don't lie to us because we've already checked. We know what the truth is. And I was like, no, I didn't go to work today. I was off today. And they were like, have you been watching the news tonight? And I hadn't. So I was like, no. And then they just meanly said, well, we have to tell you, kid, your Uncle Kenny is dead. And I was like, Uncle Kenny's dead? And I sat down and I just tried to take it all in. I had no idea what the fuck was going on. And I just assumed he had taken a bus to California and something had happened in California that got him killed. And they're like, yeah, he's dead. And we think you had something to do with this. And of course, you could imagine a scared 17-year-old kid. My shock and horror was just mounting on itself. I was like, what? I didn't have anything to do with it. I don't even know what happened. And they're like, you better not lie to us, kid. You better tell us everything you know. And then they asked me, what do you know about Jay Baggett? And it's weird. I can actually remember what I was thinking back then. And when they mentioned Jay Baggett, I still didn't realize that this had anything to do with Jay Baggett. For some reason, I just thought they were asking me baseline questions about everybody I knew to see if I would tell them the truth. I know that doesn't really make any sense, but my mind was all fucked up and I was in shock. And so I was just like, uh, Jay Baggett, he's the vice president of Intel. He's Indian. He has a son named Vinay, who I used to be friends with. And he has a daughter named Melanie, who I used to go out with. And they were like, you used to go out with his daughter? Because I guess they didn't know that. And I was like, yeah, we went out for a few months. And they were like, where were you last night? And I was like, I was with my other girlfriend, Angela Ahuja. And they were like, Ahuja? Is she Indian too? And I was like, yeah. So I guess they thought I was targeting wealthy Indian girls so they could be robbed or something. I don't fucking know. So eventually they tell me, 
Well, your Uncle Kenny kidnapped Jay Baggett and their family tonight. Which, once again, you can imagine how that made me feel. I was already in fucking shock from them being there. I was in shock for them telling me my Uncle Kenny was killed. I was fucking shocked for them telling me they thought I was involved. And now they've just told me he kidnapped my ex-girlfriend and her family. And I was like, Uncle Kenny kidnapped Jay Baggett? Like, honestly, it wasn't really all computing. It was kind of too much for my brain. They're like, yeah, he did. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a gun? And I was like, yeah, I have a gun. It's in the other room. And I did. I had this little 38 special. I had stolen it from my dad. My dad had it in one of his drawers. And the complex I moved into in Jackson, Mississippi was kind of dangerous. It was the only thing I could afford. I was the only white person there. So just for a little protection, I had stolen his gun and taken it. And he never mentioned to me that it was missing. So I guess my dad probably thought somebody else had taken it. So they were like, show us where it is. So I walked into my room and I was like, it's in the bottom drawer there. And I pointed down and I noticed that the bottom drawer was open. I had not noticed this before. I guess I should have, but I didn't. And they went over there and they looked in it and they're like, there's no gun here, son. And of course, then it immediately fucking dawned on me that my Uncle Kenny had stolen my gun. So obviously at that point, the shock and horror was reaching levels that I had never experienced before in my life, nor have I experienced since. It was fucking ridiculous. My face turned totally white and I suddenly started realizing how much shit I might be in. And they were fucking telling me, dude, you're in a lot of fucking trouble. You went down, you picked up your Uncle Kenny. You brought him back up here two hours to Jackson, Mississippi. He has your gun, and he goes over and kidnaps your ex-girlfriend and their entire family and then gets killed. You're going to jail, kid. You better tell us everything you know right fucking now. And of course, at this point, I'm bawling like a goddamn baby. No machismo, no bravado. I'm fucking breaking down like a little kid because I basically was a little kid. And they're screaming at me, telling me, you're going to do 20 years in jail, kid. Your fucking life is over. You have one chance to help yourself. You better tell us every fucking thing you know. And I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm like, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Please, just ask me anything. I'll tell you anything. Just fucking ask me. And they're like, you better tell us, son. You better tell us what you know. And I'm like, just ask me any question. I'll answer any question you have. Just please ask me anything. And it was frustrating because they weren't asking me any questions. They were just telling me to tell them what I knew. And I didn't fucking know anything, so I didn't know how to help myself. I felt helpless, like my life was over. I mean, one second, I'm literally talking to my girlfriend on the phone, and the next second, there's a knock on my door, and my fucking life is over. Not amazing. Well, anyway, they grilled me like this for probably 45 minutes, and I'm just weeping and crying and begging them to ask me any question. So they finally say, well, we don't have enough to charge you right now, but we're going to go get more evidence, and we'll be back, kid. Don't leave town. And they fucking left me there, shaking and destroyed, not knowing what the fuck I was going to do. So I just sat there and cried and cried and cried to myself for a few hours. And then eventually I decided to drive over to my Aunt Susie's house because she was the only other person I really knew in that town and try to find out what the fuck was going on. So anyway, I get there and I finally figured out what happened. And here's what fucking happened. So Kenny's at my house. He takes my gun. He gets my cousin Shannon to come pick him up, take him to the bus stop, drop him off. And then she leaves. And while he's there, he hitchhikes Back to where Jay Baggett lives. I don't know how he found out where the guy lived, but he did. And so he was hanging out outside Jay Baggett's house waiting for Jay to come home. I think he had crawled underneath one of their cars or something. He had a ski mask on and a gun in hand. And I guess Jay was working late that night. So I guess my Uncle Kenny made too much noise and Melanie came outside to see what the noise was and startled him. So he jumps out with a gun and holds him at the gunpoint and he forces them back inside the house. And they're all sitting there at gunpoint. He's waiting for Jay to come home. So Jay opens the door and comes in and my Uncle Kitty's hiding around the corner. And he walks in and tells everybody hello. And my Uncle Kitty pops out and points the gun at him and says, this is a robbery. Don't do anything stupid. And at first, Jay thought it was a joke. I guess he thought one of his son Vinay's friends was just playing a stupid gag on him. And he laughed. And my Uncle Kenny said, this ain't no joke, man. So he duct tapes Melanie and her mom. And he puts them in the closet so they can't scream or phone for help or anything. And he tells them, don't worry, I'm gay. I'm just here to rob you. I'm not going to do anything sexual with you. And as far as I know, Kenny wasn't actually gay. He just told them that to kind of ease their minds that they might be raped or something. In fact, I talked to Melanie before I shot this video to get permission to make sure it was okay with them that I'm making this video. And she gave me permission. And she said that she's been talking about this incident in therapy for a long time now. And one of the things she tells everybody was that he was actually a polite kidnapper, if such a thing exists. All things considered, he wasn't really that mean to them. So he puts them in the closet and he takes Jay Baggett in his office and he tells them he wants $1 million in ransom to let them go. 
And I guess Jay Baggett somehow talks him down out of the fucking ransom. He negotiates his own ransom down from $1 million to $750,000. I guess he told him that it would look strange if they just went into the bank and got a million dollars cash. Obviously, everybody would know something was up and the whole thing would go awry. And Jay didn't want to get killed. Jay wanted it all to go off without a hitch so his family and him wouldn't get killed. So he talks my uncle down to $750,000, so they agree that Jay would give him $750,000 for him and his family's release. So they stay there all night, and the next day, he puts Melanie and her mom in one of the Mercedes Benz, and he has Jay Baggett in the other Mercedes Benz. And of course, back then, there were no cell phones, but there were car phones, and both these expensive-ass cars had car phones. So he basically barked orders over the car phones to the car in front of him, which had Melanie and her mom in it, while he held Jay at gunpoint and had them follow them. So he had them drive to the bank, and he had Melanie's mom go in and withdraw $750,000 and put it in a big duffel bag. And look, obviously this is fucking stupid. I thought Uncle Kenny was a smart dude, but obviously he was fucking not, because immediately they knew something was up. When you go into the bank and you try to withdraw $750,000 in cash, obviously, immediately, they know something's hinky. So, of course, they asked her, ma'am, are you okay? Is something wrong? Is somebody being kidnapped? And she was like, no, no, I just need the money for business reasons. Just give me my money. And they're like, ma'am, we're not giving you $750,000. You need to come clean and tell us what's going on. So, of course, she breaks down crying and admits the entire thing, tells them that a kidnapper has her husband at gunpoint in the car and she has to bring the money out to them. So they call the FBI and the FBI comes immediately. So they give her the $750,000 in a duffel bag and tell her to give the duffel bag to the gunman. And you can actually see the duffel bag in the backseat of this picture. Michael Kenny actually did get the money, very briefly. So anyway, she goes out of the bank, gets back in the car, drives around to another location Michael Kenny tells him to, and then gets out of the car and brings the money to my Uncle Kenny's car where he's still holding Jay Baggett by gunpoint. So then my Uncle Kenny tells them, don't call the cops, don't do anything stupid. If you do, your husband's dead. And he lets them go, but he keeps Jay Baggett in the car with him, and he makes Jay drive all the way around town. And they're crisscrossing all over the streets of Jackson, Mississippi, because I guess at that point, Uncle Kenny had realized he done fucked up, and he had a tail. So he's making Jay drive him all the fuck around to try to lose the tail that he's got. And I guess at this point, Uncle Kenny is getting more and more desperate, because what he does next is probably the stupidest thing he's ever fucking done up to this point, which is incredible, because everything else he's fucking done is so goddamn stupid. What he does is he calls my Aunt Susie on the phone and he tells her, hey, while I was at the bus stop waiting for a bus to California, I got in a fight and I need you to come pick me up. I'm at Jitney Jungle parking lot and Jitney Jungle was a grocery store that was about a mile from where my Aunt Susie lived. So my Aunt Susie's like, oh shit, Kenny got into a fight. That sucks. I need to go pick him up. So she stops at the store and she gets her a big gulp full of Coke. And she drives to the parking lot, and she's sitting there in the parking lot, drinking her big gulp, waiting for Kenny to show up. And all of a sudden, he runs up to her car, and he throws the back door open, and he throws a big duffel bag in the back seat of her car. And she's startled, and she jumps, and she looks back, and she said, Damn, Kenny, you scared me. And he just looks at her with the most frightened expression you can possibly imagine. It doesn't say anything. And he just stares at her for a second silently. And then he slams the door and runs off. And she's like, What the fuck's going on? And then she watches in horror as the FBI gun him down right in front of her car. They all rushed up on him, and I guess he pulled his gun and aimed it at him or may have fired it at him, and they blew his ass away. And you guys know how shocked I was at this. You can imagine how fucking she was shocked at this. Not knowing what the fuck is going on, she watches a bunch of dudes gun her brother down right in front of her. And of course, they run over to her car, open the door, drag her ass out, throw her on the ground and arrest her as an accomplice. Like to this day, I still feel sorry for my Aunt Susie because as traumatic as this whole thing was for me, I can just imagine how traumatic this shit was for her. So anyway, they take her down to FBI headquarters and they grill her and grill her and grill her for hour after hour after hour. And I guess her story matched up to mine perfectly. And they realized that she had nothing to do with this. She didn't know what was going on. And so they finally released her. Luckily, no charges were ever filed against any of us. Because obviously we didn't know what the fuck was going on. But believe me, we were both terrified for months after that eventually they would come back and actually charge us with something. So for the next few months, I was basically shitting bricks every goddamn day of my life waiting to be arrested. But luckily, I never heard anything else about this from the FBI. But here's the weird part. The next day after all this happened, I came home 
and I realized that my Uncle Kenny had left me his computer. I guess he figured he did not need it anymore. If he got away with the crime, he would buy himself a better computer, and if he didn't, he'd be dead and wouldn't need it. So he left the computer to me, I guess as payment for stealing my gun. And it was the first computer I ever had that was actually capable of getting on the internet. And the very next year, the internet came out, became a big thing. It had really not been available to the public up until that point. And I used this computer he gave me to get on the internet and start a business. And now I have been working on the internet as my full-time job ever since that day for... Almost 25 years now, the internet has been my full-time job. So this crazy-ass set of events directly led to the reason I'm on YouTube today. It's basically my origin story. Had all that stupid shit not happened, I doubt I would be here right now. And I didn't actually talk to Melanie about any of this for years and years and years. As you can imagine, I was humiliated by the whole thing. As terrifying as this was for me and my Aunt Susie, you could imagine how terrifying it was for her and her family. And I was also really angry my Uncle Kenny had done this. Because like I said, Jay Baggett was one of the nicest, best men I'd ever met. A person who had treated me more like family. Damn, I'm trying not to cry. A person who had treated me more like family than much of my own family had. And a guy who definitely did not deserve to be treated like this. And I was mad at my Uncle Kenny. And I was mad at myself for running my goddamn mouth and leading to this. It's actually really emotional for me to relive all this. But eventually, years later, I did contact Melanie on Facebook and apologize and believe me guys, the I'm sorry my uncle kidnapped you and your entire family conversation was awkward as fuck. But she was really gracious about it. She was very nice. They've all been very nice about it. She told me that she knew that I had nothing to do with it so that forgiveness was not necessary. And I really appreciate it. Well, anyway, this story gets even fucking crazier because years later, I found out through rumors in the family that apparently my Uncle Kenny had been a hitman. Apparently, and this is what I've been told, he did a couple hit jobs in the past to make ends meet. My understanding is one of the guys he killed, he buried out in the Nevada desert. And I'm thinking, holy shit, this is a guy who partially helped raise me. Why was I allowed to be around this dude? And I also think back to my childhood, and my Uncle Kenny loved computer games, and he would always buy these computer games, and he would want to play me. And every fucking single time I would beat him, he would get these games and he would practice for weeks and weeks just to beat me. And I would come in never having seen the games and I would whoop his ass every fucking time. Literally, he never won a single game ever against me on anything. So I can imagine he must have wanted to kill me like a million times. What the fuck? If I would have known, I guarantee you I would have let him win a few. But anyway, luckily he didn't kill me. He just behaved like a total fucking dumbass and got his own self killed. And it's crazy to think, but he was the same exact age as I am right now when all that happened. I can't even imagine being a grown-ass man like I am today and doing anything so fucking stupid. I really can't imagine what was even going on in his fucking head. But anyway, obviously I've taken a lot of valuable lessons from this. One of them is be careful who the fuck you run your mouth to. If you know shit about other people, don't tell anybody. Ain't nobody's business. And number two, since the computer he left me led to my lifelong employment, I now see that sometimes the most fucked up things that happen to you can actually lead to positive things down the road in ways you can't possibly imagine. You just have to let the bad things roll off of you because this life is too absurd to take seriously most of the time. But like I said, I talked to Melanie before I did this video and I got her side of the story and I got their permission to do this video. And I'm happy to say that she's doing great these days. She's married with kids. And they actually own this badass vegan restaurant in Nashville, Tennessee called The Wild Cow. It's got great reviews. It's supposed to be an amazing place. So if you live in Nashville or if you're just passing through Nashville, be sure to stop by The Wild Cow Restaurant. And while you're there, ask for Melanie and tell her Dusty says he's sorry that he ran his stupid goddamn mouth and got you and your family kidnapped by his uncle. My bad. Thanks for listening to my fucked up origin story. I love you guys. As always, until next time, logic. Fuck yes. Hey guys, Dusty Smith here, and this is Patty, one of our rescues at the Humanist Society of Mississippi Animal Sanctuary. And as many of you may know, I'm no longer making any money off YouTube on my videos. So if you guys would like to help ensure this channel doesn't disappear for good, please consider supporting us on Patreon. I'm sorry, baby. I know. It really helps. Thanks a lot, guys.